Okay, hello. I hope everyone enjoyed getting to hear some professional and personal highlights about our amazing presenters in the video. Now it is my honor to kick off, formally kick off, the presentation portion of the Ed Forum Day One by introducing Dr. Murray Gertz of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Gertz has a long track record of significant achievements in WM research and in treating WM patients. And you can learn more about him by visiting his bio in the Virtual Resources Center. Dr. Gertz is going to share his popular and unique garden talk, immediately followed by live Q&A. So enjoy the show from your front row seats, wherever you may be. Dr. Gertz. Thank you, Mr. Donardis. Um, this is really kind of an introductory talk on macroglobulinemia. You can think about it as Waldenstrom's 101. And to just help facilitate the understanding, I use a, a metaphor where we think about um, a garden uh, populated in your body. And I use that to help facilitate just kind of understanding. So I've made a number of cartoons that I'll use to start talking about this. So here, I'll bring this up. That's not a donut. What that is, is a soup bone that you buy in the store. That soup bone that you see in the store has a thick outer white hard shell, and it also has a central core in the soup bone. That central core, when you see it in a soup bone, is kind of brownish and spongy, and that is a consequence of oxidation that occurs after an animal is sacrificed because in a freshly slaughtered animal, that little central area of the bone is not brown and spongy. It's bright red, and it's the same color as blood because that central marrow cavity within the bone is where all your blood is produced. And so the simplest way to think about this, conceptualize it, is to think about your bone marrow as a garden. And this garden inside the bone marrow is planted with multiple different crops that are seeds, that are plants. The plants bear fruit. The fruit is actually then your blood. And when we think about the different crops in this bone marrow garden, there are three major crops. About 60% of the acreage in the garden is planted with infection-fighting white blood cells. That's that Their primary goal is to protect you against infection. Approximately 10% of the garden acreage is given over to the production of cells that help your blood clot. Cells are called platelets. It's not important, but they're blood clotting cells. And then 20% of that acreage that you get are actually used to produce the red blood cells in your body. The red blood cells are the cells that contain hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen to your tissues uh, to, so you can metabolize your your calories and create um, energy. And so that's the key 20% in macroglobulinemia in that if you don't produce enough red blood cells, that 20%, you end up being anemic. You have low red blood cells, you get low hemoglobin, and as a consequence, you just run down your fatigue, you're short of breath, climbing stairs, you're apathetic, you're running low on energy. And we refer to that as being anemic. And we can measure that in the blood count, that anemia as a low hemoglobin or a low hematocrit or low red blood cell count, all of which is included on in any blood count you've ever had. And of course, the most common cause of anemia is a lack of iron because you need iron to build hemoglobin. Uh, but that has no role in macroglobulinemia. A lot of patients ask, um, 
if I feed my garden iron, will it help it grow better, fertilizing it with iron? The answer is no, because that's really not what the consequence is. The problem really occurs in that among the white blood cells, the white blood cells, which represent 60% of the acreage of this garden, there's a subset of white blood cells called lymphocytes. And what will happen is one of these white blood cells will change. It'll become mutated. It'll acquire genetic problems. And when that happens, these cells begin to selectively grow in the garden and begin to repopulate the garden with those unwanted cells. So when we talk about the bone marrow garden itself, which normally has one or 2% of these lymphocytes, which I made these little dots here, it begins to overgrow the garden like this. And so conceptually, these unwanted cells that begin to grow within that garden space, I like to think of for simplicity as weeds. And of course, these weeds are the Waldenstrom cells. These are the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma cells that begin to grow and begin to replace the normal garden growth and starts to interfere with the normal, appropriate, healthy growth of the garden. Now, those of you who have a little higher level of sophistication would know that um, the mutation that occurs in the white blood cells that leads them to become uh, weeds and makes them superior growth is that MYD88 mutation. And that's a mutation that really defines lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, these weeds that interfere and is well recognized then to be responsible for the selective growth and repopulation of the garden as these weeds overgrow. So as these weeds overgrow, they begin to choke off the normal garden growth. They'll begin to actually grow these weeds and start to increase in numbers in the garden. These cells are present normally, maybe 1% to 2% lymphoplasmacytic cells in the garden, but then they'll begin to grow. And when they grow, they can be 10%, 20%, When the number of these abnormal cells goes above 10% by agreement among the doctors who care for this, then we'll refer to it as Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Less than 10% does not fulfill those criteria. But it's important to understand that simply having weeds in a garden, simply having weeds in a garden does not necessarily mean that you have to do something about it. it, it it's not required. Um, you can have a pretty healthy garden that has 10, 20, even 30, 40% weeds, but the garden's working well. It's making uh, plenty of hemoglobin, so you're not anemic, plenty of white cells, so you're not at risk of infection, and plenty of blood clotting cells, so there's no bleeding risk. And so, it's very common for the garden to have weeds in it and absolutely fulfill the criteria for Waldenstrom's and have a physician say, we don't need to do anything with this garden. We're just going to watch and we're going to wait, which is really just meaning we're going to put you under very careful surveillance so we can monitor you carefully so that we can intervene before it causes a problem. And so technically having weeds in the garden, just having them there doesn't mean you need to do anything about it. You can just kind of keep an eye on it. And so, and technically when someone has more than 10% weeds in their garden, but uh, it's not interfering with the garden growth, we'll refer to that as smoldering Waldenstroms. And these weeds don't just grow in the bone marrow garden. They'll grow in 
lymph nodes, the liver, and the spleen. And that's often why individuals who are originally diagnosed with this will have a PET scan or a CAT scan to just kind of image the body just to determine if there's any real evidence of involvement of those organs so that occasionally very, very large lymph nodes may require treatment or significant involvement of the liver or spleen may require treatment. You want to know about that by doing appropriate imaging, but realistically, it's really usually the garden that drives the need for therapy. The garden itself if it's functioning well and anemia is not a major problem or a symptomatic problem, and because these weeds grow very, very slowly in the overwhelming majority of patients, there really isn't any obligation to do anything or to intervene in any way. So that's the smoldering component. Those of you who know realize that in order to make this diagnosis, you need to get a sample of the garden. You've got to sample the garden so you can do the count of the weeds. And of course, that's the bone marrow examination, uh, generally where a needle is inserted into the pelvic bone so we can withdraw a sample and get some idea of relative proportion of how many of the red blood cell plants are growing, how many of the white cell plants are growing, and what's the weed percentage, which is estimated out of the bone marrow itself. Now, one interesting thing about these weeds is they're capable of producing a protein. And the protein that they produce is called an immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulins, everybody has immunoglobulins, and they're actually part of your immune system. They help protect you against infections. And... Patients who have these specific types of weeds in the garden that have this MYD88 mutation that gives them this growth advantage tend to make immunoglobulin proteins that are abnormal. Now, the proteins that they make when they were first discovered in the late 40s and early 50s are very, very large proteins. These are much bigger proteins than the normal proteins found in your body. And so, the protein was referred to as a macro globulin, globulin being a blood protein that is different from albumin, which is egg white protein, which is the dominant protein in your bloodstream. And so they make this macro globulin or IgM protein. And it's important for patients to understand that the disease is not the IgM protein. The disease itself are the weeds. That's the problem. It's the weeds. The IgM protein is a simple byproduct of the weeds that for the majority of patients isn't a problem. And it, the IgM is not the disease. The weeds produced are the problem. The IgM protein is a marker, and we're very fortunate to have it because as a marker, it gives us an indirect measure of how many weeds there are in the garden. Now, the absolute size of the IgM varies immensely from one patient to the next. Everybody's totally different on this. And so comparing the size of your IgM one amongst the other is, it, it isn't going to go anywhere. I mean, uh, uh, patients who have an IgM of a 1,000 or an M spike of one can have actually quite severe disease. And patients who have an IgM of 5,000 or an M spike of five grams may not need treatment, be continued observation because the amount of protein produced by your weeds is individualized for every patient. Some people make very small amounts, but can have a lot of weeds. And some people make exuberant amounts, but only have small numbers of weeds not requiring. But what is relevant is that your protein level is a really good measure of your weeds. So following that protein level over time allows you to understand exactly what 
is going on in your garden with regard to the weed growth. So if you're being basically on careful surveillance, watch and wait, and the IgM protein is relatively unchanged over time as it's being measured every three months or six months or once a year, whatever, if it isn't changing in any way, then you can really make a pretty good inference that the number of weeds in the garden aren't growing. If the protein is rising but very, very slowly, then you would infer that the weeds themselves are also growing very slowly and probably intervention is not going to be required. But if you're being monitored and you're seeing the IgM level rise rapidly, you probably should anticipate and begin to make plans that you're going to need some form of intervention before those weeds overgrow the garden and interfere with the garden so much that it is going to cause a problem. Usually for most patients, it's problems with progressive anemia. People who are diagnosed with a significant disease often are so anemic at the time of diagnosis, they'll need a blood transfusion in order to just fuel up their oxygen carrying capacity. And so that IgM level is a tumor marker. It's a wonderful measure of weeds. And this way, unlike some patients with hematologic malignancy, you want to know how they're doing. They need to get a bone marrow three, four times a year. Otherwise, you just don't know what their weeds are doing. Not so in macroglobulinemia. You really need a bone marrow for diagnosis. But after that, it's usually okay to simply monitor the IgM in an individual patient because it will give you real insight, real insight into how active your disease is. So the IgM protein, you must keep in mind, is not the problem. The problem are the weeds, and the IgM is a protein byproduct that's useful for monitoring and for you to know what your disease activity is. And as I'll be getting to later, if you're being treated, then you would expect that as you kill the weeds, the IgM protein will decline because there are less weeds producing it. And you'll see that as evidence of a response. And we have specific criteria um, of response based on the percentage decline in the IgM. Uh, usually the, the criteria, did the protein go down 25 to 50%, 50% to 90%, over 90% or did it disappear completely? Now, having said that the weeds are the problem and the protein isn't the problem, there is one exception. In medicine, there's always an exception. The IgM protein, because of its very, very large size, macro, it can actually interfere with the flow of blood because as the protein accumulates in the blood, it can actually thicken the blood and make the blood more viscous. Now let's talk about viscosity. All, all fluids flow. I mean, that's normal and you can take fluids and move them through tubing. Um, and the amount of force that's required to move fluids through a tube, that could be water through your gardening hose, is determined by how viscous it is. So let me give you three specific liquids to think about. Water, maple syrup that you use for your pancakes and waffles, and ketchup. All three of those are liquids. Ketchup's an emulsion, but it's a liquid and it flows. And you know if you want to pour water, pour maple syrup, and pour ketchup out of an open container, they're going to flow at different rates because there's an increase in the viscosity of the maple syrup and the ketchup. For those of you who are mechanically inclined, you know viscosity in terms of automotive motor oil. And the viscosity is measured by weight. It's 5W, 5 weight, 10 weight, 20 weight, 30 weight, 40 weight. And the higher weights 
tend to be the more viscous oils because they're more resistant to heat. So as the IgM protein, the blood becomes more viscous. So instead of flowing like water, it flows like maple syrup and in extreme instances will flow like ketchup. And that thickening can cause problems as it begins to interfere with the easy flow of blood. Now, moving liquids, viscous liquids, depends on the size of your tubing or your pipe. If you had a garden hose, you could still pump ketchup and you could pump maple syrup. But as the size of the piping goes down, if you start to want to move maple syrup or ketchup through a drinking straw, it's not always so easy. If you think about a milkshake, because milkshakes are very viscous, they're thick because of the ice cream in them, the amount of suction you have to apply to a drinking straw to move that from the container of the milkshake into your mouth, that actually takes a fair amount of force. And as it gets more viscous, it becomes harder and harder to draw. Now, if you move from a drinking straw down to a, let's say, a coffee stirrer, which has a very, very small uh, hole size, you could probably drink coffee through it, but I bet you couldn't drink ketchup through it. You wouldn't be able to suck hard enough to draw such a viscous liquid through. And that's what happens when hyperviscosity occurs. When the IgM levels get very high, usually above 5,000, that interferes with flow in blood vessels. Now in large blood vessels, like the arteries to your hand or the aorta or the arteries to your legs, those vessels are big enough that even when they're viscous, there's not much problem with blood flow. But when you start getting into the really, really, really tiny blood vessels, then the flow gets really to be a problem. And what's going on, of course, is your heart is acting as a piston to push the blood forward through those blood vessels, but there's a lot of resistance to its motion when you get into the tiny blood vessels. So in most instances, that isn't the problem. But where you have blood vessels that don't have good support and the piston of the heart is pushing that thick, thick blood, it can cause the blood vessels to tear. So where does this occur? Well, the two most common places are in the nose because your nose it has tissue support for the blood vessels only on one side, the outside, the inside of your nose is open air. And so what will happen as the blood thickens up to be ketchup-like and the heart keeps pushing it through those vessels, it'll tear the vessels. The drag is so much, it'll rip the blood vessel and you'll get a nosebleed as it pours out through the open area. The second place where the size of the protein is the eye. You know the back of the eye is the retina. And if the blood flow starts to get in those small vessels, it will tear those retinal blood vessels. And there's no support in the front because all you have is that jelly part in your eye and the blood can pour out due to a retinal hemorrhage and cause serious and sometimes permanent visual loss. And so the protein generally is not the problem, but about 10 to 15% of patients at presentation present with this thickening of the blood due to this macroglobulin that leads usually, the most common is bleeding, gum bleeding, nose bleeding, eye bleeding due to hyperviscosity. And in rare instances, to manage that, I mean, you have to kill the weeds for sure, but to manage that, sometimes you'll actually take the watery part out of the blood and replace it with non-protein containing fluids. That's plasma exchange, where we take out the thick, viscous, ketchupy plasma and replace it with water. That's not a very common problem, but sometimes can be a presenting feature of this disease. Now, with the increasing utilization of screening laboratory and chemistries, increasing numbers of patients are being found with small IgM levels, small macroglobulins in the blood. 
usually less than 2,000. And they're usually detected simply because they have a high total amount of protein in the blood. And that elevated total protein leads to an investigation of why the protein is high. And you end up finding um, this IgM protein. Now, in patients who have this incidentally found protein, sometimes, not always, if they're very small, you don't need to do anything. But for some people, it's high enough that you actually have to do a bone marrow. And if it's over 10% weeds, then we'd refer to that as smoldering macroglobulinemia. But there are patients who will have small IgM proteins, but don't have 10% weeds in the garden, and we wouldn't call that macroglobulinemia if it's under 10%. Those patients are labeled IgMMGUS, monoclonal gammopathy undetermined significance. So these are patients with IgM mugus who are also only monitored, but their risk of developing Waldenstrom's is lower because they're starting with a much lower number of weeds. And the prevalence of incidentally finding these proteins in adults is shockingly high. IgM MGUS or MUGUS is actually found in one in 300 people over the age of 60, one in 300. And so over the age of 60 in this country, we have probably about 30 million people. And so one in 300 of that is up over 100,000 people with IgM MGUS. So although Waldenstrom's is rare, IgM monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance isn't rare. And fortunately, the risk of developing Waldenstrom's is relatively low. It runs at about 2% per year. So it's a relatively, for most people, benign problem. And it's not unusual for patients to have this IgM MGUS incidentally detected protein without uh, enough weeds in the garden to actually take 20 years to develop problems if they're going to develop problems. So it's important to remember that IgM mugus and Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia do not require any type of therapeutic intervention. They're simply on surveillance with very careful monitoring, preferably by someone who sees this relatively um, frequently. And so again, with the exception of the rare patient with hyperviscosity, the IgM is not the problem. The weeds are the problem, but it is important for you to know what your IgM level is because you can track it and understand whether you're stable or progressing or if you're not, um, um, if it's declining, then you're responding to treatment. So then the question comes up, well, if I have weeds in my garden, why aren't I being treated? Why are they telling me I have cancer and they're doing nothing about it? Every other TV commercial I see says that the cancer needs to be diagnosed early and treated aggressively. And you're telling me that I, I don't really need to. Um, be treated. Why is that? Why, why are you diagnose this cancer? And that makes me nervous. You're just going to watch me. And the reality is this, for many, many cancers, early treatment results in cure. Nobody would tell a woman who had a breast lump on a mammogram not to have it removed because it was not symptomatic. And no one would tell someone with a colonic mass found on a colonoscopy not to do anything because you're not having pain or bleeding. And the reason, of course, is if those are managed appropriately, you will cure this. And unfortunately, macroglobulinemia isn't curable. It's highly treatable, but you can't cure it. And if you can't cure it and delay doesn't make any difference at all, which it doesn't, then it becomes reasonable to simply monitor it because the treatment isn't vitamins and it isn't oxygenated water. It's weed killer. And no matter how you classify this, whether you say it's rituximab, bendamustine, ibrutinib, cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, they're all weed killers. 
And weed killers have consequences. They have side effects. Some of the side effects reversible. Some of the side effects not reversible. A very common consequence of treatment is a significantly increased risk of infections. And doing this to patients who have no symptoms at all and feel great and may not develop active symptoms for years, it's very, very hard to justify treatment that can have long-lasting side effects and cause immediate declines in the quality of your life. And so this is the reason why, even though there is a slow-growing cancer present, there is not a compelling reason to intervene or do anything whatsoever about it directly because of the fact that you can't cure it, regrettably. I mean, someday if we could cure it, you'll be diagnosed, we'll give you that pill, you'll be cured, and then you don't ever have to see us again, and I can retire. But realistically, that's not what we do, and so we do need to watch to be sure we hit that sweet spot between someone who's not symptomatic and someone who's significantly anemic so we can begin to put weed killer into that garden and kill the weeds. One of the obvious things that most people understand about using garden weed killer is that the weed killer doesn't just kill the weeds selectively. It kills the weeds, but it also can kill the healthy garden plants as well. And so the reason you see an experienced specialist is that they know what brand of weed killer to use, what type of weed killer is appropriate, how often you give the weed killer, what the weed killer dose is, and then what to monitor for side effects, because which is really just another way to say something you all intuitively know. And that is that chemotherapy doesn't just kill the bad cells. It kills good cells as well. It doesn't just kill the Waldenstrom cells, but the healthy garden plants are being destroyed as well. That's why those of you who are on treatment I don't care what the treatment is. If you're on treatment, you're having your blood count checked very, very regularly. For most people, that blood count would be done weekly. For some people, it would be done monthly. But there's no question while you're on treatment, you're actually having your blood counts checked regularly. And that's so your provider understands the dosing to be sure they're not killing too many of the healthy garden plants. The most common problem patients will see will be a reduction in their infection fighting white blood cell count. And what will happen is if the dose is higher than may be appropriate for you, you'll see a reduction in the white cell count and the doctor or the nurse will say, well, we're not gonna give you treatment today or we're going to interrupt the treatment today. We're going to give you a break in treatment so you can have a little bit of recovery of your normal healthy garden plants. And we'll deal with the weeds later. And sometimes people will get a shot. They'll get a shot of garden fertilizer, which is technically referred to as growth factor or GCSF, which will selectively improve the growth of the normal healthy garden plant so you can continue to give the weed killer on schedule without having to worry about lowering your body's immunity so much that you end up at significant risk of developing infection. For some practices, it'll vary. That risk of infection is such that it's not uncommon that you'll be put on a preventative antibiotic during the early phases of your treatment. Usually that would be an antibiotic pill. It, it, it could be a sulfa drug. It's, it's difficult to, to say. And so then I want to circle back about, about a little bit about the prognosis and this issue of not treating the weeds when they're there. It's very interesting in that when we look at what determines outcome in macroglobulinemia. It turns out that the percentage of weeds in the garden is not predictive of anything. So that somebody with 50% weeds, 
doesn't necessarily do better than someone with 80 or 90 percent weeds. That's actually not relevant. If you look at all the different staging systems and things that determine prognosis, the percentage of Waldenstrom cells in the bone marrow isn't prognostic. Why is that? Well, let's think about a bladder infection. So if you have a bladder infection, no one says, how much is the bladder infection? How many bacteria are in the urine? People don't ask that. They don't want to know if it's a small amount of infection or a large amount of infection, just where I don't actually care if I need to treat a patient, whether they have a low amount of Waldenstrom's or a high amount of Waldenstrom's. What's really important for the bladder infection is not how much. What's important is that you choose the correct antibiotic. If you get the right antibiotic, it kills the infection. It doesn't matter how much there is. It's the same thing in macroglobulinemia. It isn't a question of how many malignant cells there are. The real question is, is are those cells going to be sensitive to the selected weed killer so that the weed killer results in significant destruction? A significant, doesn't have to be all of them. Most people don't get all of them, but enough reduction in the weeds so that you can restore the garden to a healthy situation so that the garden can start to regrow in a healthy, normal manner. And so that's important. And patients with Waldenstrom's are incredibly um, fortunate because, number one, they have so many choices of therapy that are highly effective. They're at least five effective classes with new ones being developed as we speak. Some of them actually targeted against specific Waldenstrom's genes that are extremely effective. And because the disease itself really is pretty sensitive to treatment, it's, it's not common to encounter patients who aren't highly responsive to any of the selective treatments. And although the disease isn't cured and can recur, that recurrence is usually a pretty slow process. So once you treat a patient, even if the protein begins to rise again, it can take years before the reduced number of weeds in the garden regrow to start again to interfere. And so a rising protein level, increasing weeds, does not require that you do anything as long as your garden remains healthy. So let me just summarize, and then we can leave 20 minutes for questions. The disease itself is incurable, but does not always need treatment. Its primary problem is that it interferes with the normal function of your bone marrow garden in producing blood cells, the most common being hemoglobin and anemia. With the exception of hyperviscosity syndrome, the IgM is just a tool that we use to understand where the disease is at a given time, whether it's stable, increasing, decreasing, but not to be used for people to compare with each other the size of their IgM because that's not relevant and that we have very highly effective therapy. So I think I'll stop there and turn things back over to Peter. And if there are specific audience questions that you'd like to discuss, or if I left things somewhat unclear for you, I'll be happy to kind of review that again. So thanks again. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Gertz. Um, everyone, please, if you haven't already, enter your questions in the Q&A portion um, on, uh, on the screen. And... Uh, Dr. Gertz will be happy to answer them. We appreciate Dr. Gertz and his amazing talk is always very informative. I remember hearing it for the first time in an ed forum a few years back. And every time I hear it, I still learn something new. Uh, and I take away a new important point that I probably hadn't quite listened to as well as I should have in the past. Uh, so now uh, I'll turn it back to Dr. Gertz and have him answer some questions. I'm ready. I, are you reading them to me, Peter, or do you want me oh, to? I can, um... Oh, I can do that. Sure. 
Yeah, why don't you just kind of toss them to me? You can select them or edit them mm -hmm. if, if for clarity if you want. Sure, no problem. Um, okay, uh, we have a question from Lee. Is it that the lymphoplasmacytic cells are immortal and as they arise, they, they accumulate or and or are the lymphoplasmacytic cells actually dividing? Uh, uh, it's actually a very good question. The um, growth rate, the dividing rate of Waldenstrom cells is extremely, extremely slow. Uh, so that generally isn't the problem, but they really do have a very, they're not immortal, but they have a very, very long half-life in the system. And so, yes, they do die, but uh, they live a long time. And, and I think it's that slow growth rate, the slow division rate, dividing rate, that results in the good prognosis. I'm telling you that in cancers where the dividing rate is high, those cells not only grow quickly, but they also have advanced mechanisms for the development of resistance to weed killer. And that means that you run out of therapeutic options relatively quickly. These tend to be not immortal, but very long-lived cells, very long-lived cells. And as a consequence, um, the problem really is accumulation. I'll give you one other example of that. Those patients who've been on treatment with this disease, if they track it, they'll see that when they get treated, in some instances, it depends on the weed killer, the IgM level actually falls relatively slowly, and it even continues to fall after the chemo stopped. And the reason for that is that although the weed killer has poisoned the Waldenstrom cell, it can still make IgM and it won't die until it tries to divide. It actually poisons the DNA so that the cell is alive and can still make IgM. But when it tries to divide into two cells, the poison DNA won't let it, the cell dies. But that can take months. And so you'll see the IgM level trickle down after one cycle, depending on the weed killer. You can actually be disappointed that the IgM didn't go down very far that's because, well, the cells may be poisoned, but they still haven't died yet. They die slowly. And in patients who finish a course of treatment, let's say you're on a treatment that you take for four to six months, you can see that IgM level fall for the next six to eight months after treatment's discontinued because the cells are continuing to die long after the chemotherapy has been stopped. So slow growth rate, long life. Thank you. Um, and, and does that the timing of that um of the death of those cells is it dependent on what type of treatment you're having so maybe with rituxan it would take longer and possibly with a btk inhibitor it would happen faster yes that's exactly correct so with most traditional chemotherapy rituximab bendamustine bortezomib cyclophosphamide responses are slow with treatment like ibrutinib, acalbrutinib, zanubrutinib, the BTK inhibitors, those tend to be rapid. And it has to do with the mechanism in which they kill the cell that uh, with ibrutinib and its BTK cousins doesn't require the cell to divide in order to kill it. And so there you'll see faster reductions. But I will tell you that just in terms of therapeutic decision making, how fast the IgM goes down is usually not very relevant. I mean, the speed to achieve a response generally isn't prognostic. Depth of response is prognostic, and getting a response is important. But whether you uh, get the response in one month, two months, or 10 months, it's generally not important with the rare exception of people who have symptomatic hyperviscosity. There you need the IgM level to go down quickly so you don't have to do lots of washing out of the blood to remove the thick protein. Thank you. Interesting. Um, we have another question from Neil. Uh, would like you to discuss why bone marrow biopsies show inconsistent WM infiltration levels and the significance of that. So that's true for all hematologic malignancies. The infiltration in the bone marrow is spotty. Uh, and so one has to be very careful uh, 
in not making decisions based on the percentage of weeds in the garden because you're sampling the garden. And if you took a regular garden that had weeds in it, there might be areas of the garden where it's overrun and there may be areas of the garden where it's relatively sparse. And so, for example, you don't make a decision about whether a patient needs treatment because the sample you took showed 70% weeds. That would be inappropriate because if you have someone, I'll give you an example, who showed 70%, had an M protein of a gram and a half, had a hemoglobin of 14 and was not symptomatic, I can tell you I'm not treating because I don't think that 70% is an accurate reflection of what's really going on in the garden. It confirms the diagnosis. So that's very, very helpful. Might allow me to do genetic studies that are helpful. But it's not going to be the driver of you need treatment because I don't believe you could have 70% weeds in your garden and have no impact on your blood counts. You hit a hot spot. And, um, and in the original lymphoma studies, original lymphoma studies, people would have bone marrows simultaneously bilaterally. So, you know, you get your bone marrow, it's either on the right side or the left side, it may change. In days gone by, we did them both. And when you compared the two, they were really out of line. I mean, they were very discordant. And so be aware that the garden involvement with weeds is quite spotty and sporadic. And so although it's important for diagnosis, it's not used for the decision-making process. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I have curiosity then, is there any other mechanism that is being explored that uh, could be a better barometer than the bone marrow biopsy? Well, quite frankly, in my practice, I don't do bone marrows very often. I mean, I do a bone marrow diagnosis, but then I follow the IgM and the blood counts and the patient's symptoms. And I think, well, in my practice, I certainly do not do surveillance bone marrows. I'm not doing a bone marrow like once a year just to see what's going on because I know what's going on from the IgM, blood counts, chemistries, patient symptoms. If I'm making a major change in therapy, I'll do a bone marrow. There are certain circumstances where a bone marrow is required. As it's beyond the scope of my talk, but about 10% of patients with Waldenstrom's can undergo what's called large cell transformation or Richter's transformation, changes to a different kind of lymphoma. Well, if it's changing to a different kind of lymphoma, you need a bone marrow. Or if there's evidence of significant chemotherapy, weed killer damage to the garden, so that the garden seeds are not functioning well, which the technical term for this is MDS, um, you need a bone marrow to look at that. But for just standard Waldenstrom's, after I get my original diagnosis, I don't do it. People who participate in clinical trials, a bone marrow is always required, but that's a clinical trial parameter, not something that is a required clinical. I mean, um, sometimes if I'm changing treatment, I'll do it. But in an otherwise stable patient feeling well, I don't find an indication to do very many bone marrows. And so in my practice, that usually isn't a major issue simply because they're pretty infrequent and spaced out pretty far. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Lee. He's asking how um, how large of a role do anti apoptic BCL two proteins play in WM and keeping the LPL cells from dying? Well, they they are important, and the fact that uh, BCL overexpression leads to improved survival is the reason why venetoclax is so active in the treatment of Waldenstrom. So venetoclax. I think his trade name is Venclexa, is a very active treatment for Waldenstrom's. There's no doubt about it. And there are trials now looking at it being combined with other chemotherapeutic agents, including Ibrutinib, in trying to use that targeted therapy because what it does is it inhibits BCL2 and it does lead to Waldenstrom cell death. And one of the nice advantages also is that Venetoclax is an oral treatment and is well tolerated. And so usually we don't measure directly BCL2 expression on the cell, but typically what we'll do 
is we'll do fish studies on the chromosomes in the uh, Waldenstrom cell. And if we find an 1114 translocation, that usually is a pretty good surrogate marker for high expression of BCL2. I can't hear you, Peter. Uh, another question we have, this one's from Sherry. Um, and uh, she has an unusual situation and wants to know if you've ever come across it. She had single IgM kappa spike for a year, but after COVID booster, second shin rates, and EvuShield, she now has four different IgM kappa spikes. Um, yeah. And have you ever seen that? Is it? Uh, oh, yeah, that that's not uncommon. And those will be temporary and they're going to disappear. Um, Immunoglobulins are part of your immune system, and IgM is produced in response in normal people to any infection or any vaccine they've ever had. It's part of a normal, healthy immune response that you start to develop new antibodies, new immunoglobulins, new antibodies to infection or vaccination. And so you can develop this multi-clonal response those tend to be transient, and then as that response, those will fall, and those clones will disappear. You also see that after, we see it all the time in patients who have stem cell transplant. When we ablate their bone marrow and their immunoglobulin-producing cells begin to recover, we start to see all types of new clones that are part of that recovery process, start maybe one, two, four, and then eventually it'll be polyclonal, it'll disappear. And so that's not an unusual, unexpected, and it really, it's quite benign, doesn't carry any bad significance at all. Great, that's good to know, thank you. Um, a question from a patient who has uh, um, DVT uh, and was just diagnosed with WM and is off blood thinners. Um, you have any opinions on someone who has DVT and WM, what the proper course is for them? Yeah, normally I wouldn't stop the blood thinner. Um, I, if you have DVT, uh, that carries some pretty serious immediate risk uh, blood clots do. Uh, most Waldenstrom's patients don't have much serious immediate risk. And normally the use of blood thinners normally doesn't interfere with treatment. And I'll give you a much better example that because the Waldenstrom's population tends to be on the older side of the equation, over 70, there's really a fair number of patients with Waldenstrom who happen to have atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is the single most common heart rhythm disturbance in the United States. And people with atrial fibrillation need blood thinners to prevent um, stroke, blood clots forming in the heart. And it's very common for people to be on blood thinners for atrial fibrillation, more so than DVT, where they're really we don't worry about the treatment and management. We're able to manage through that. And I don't see that as a significantly increased risk factor. Thank you. Yeah, so do treatments like uh, BTK inhibitors like abrutinib, do they add any complexity to that decision? Oh, I think so. I think that if someone was on blood thinners, I wouldn't be very excited about using a BTK inhibitor. Um, uh, BTK inhibitors, clearly one of their off-target effects is an increase in bruising and an increase in bleeding. And so I would say for that circumstance where there's already an enhanced bleeding risk because of the blood thinner, for that specific patient, I'd say, yeah, I don't think a BTK inhibitor is the best choice. Thank you. Um, does a uh, question from Richard, does the MYD88L265P mutation cause WM? Oh, that's pretty hard. I, 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 the, <laughs> it's hard because you know there's 10% of patients who have full-blown WM who don't have MYD88, although the biologic behavior is a little bit different in those patients. So you don't have to have the MYD88. But you know, in transgenic animals, you can actually insert the MYD88 gene and they do develop a picture. It's not exactly Walden's, but they develop a, a lymphoma picture. But it's very, very difficult to say whether if you get the MYD88 mutation, you get Walden's or 
it's after you get Waldenstrom's, it shows. This is important because MYD88 is extremely common in IgM MGUS. You get it in MGUS. You can get it in mantle cell lymphoma. You can get it in marginal zone lymphoma. So it's not specific because patients can have Waldenstrom's without the mutation. And it's not sensitive because you can have the mutation and you can have benign conditions like IgM MGUS and splenic marginal zone lymphoma. So, okay. Um, and uh, sort of a related question, but do BTK inhibitors uh, reduce the weeds, uh, weed cells in the bone marrow? Oh, absolutely they do. They directly kill those. Uh, when you get that, I mean, it kills those weeds and you'll see that because the IgM level will fall. But more importantly, for those people who are anemic as a trigger of them, you'll see their hemoglobin start to climb. Usually, usually it was in the first month, actually, that the um, it, it will climb. So it, 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 you know, all of the treatments for macroglobulinemia are weed killers, every one of them. Okay, great. Um, then another question is that given that WM is incurable, uh, is it possible to have 0% WM cells in the bone marrow after treatment? Oh, yeah. It's not very common. It's probably less than 5% of patients. But there are patients in whom you get a complete disappearance of the uh, IgM. Again, it's not a common event, and I normally don't tell patients that that's very likely. But it is possible for all of the weeds to be eradicated so you can't see them. You can't detect them. That doesn't mean you're cured, however. Um, it's just that they're below the level of the threshold of detection. So it's a very, very good. I mean, because there's no detectable weeds, but that would not be the equivalent to cure. But people do achieve what we refer as complete responses 5% of the time. Okay, thank you. Um, and with regards to the weeds and, and WM, What's the relationship between WM and neuropathy? What brings about neuropathy? Oh, that's that's really a good question. So what happens is, I told you the protein's not important, but in that it's important as well. There's a fatty sheet that winds around the nerve. The nerve is an electrical wire, and there's a wire, and there's insulation around the wire. And if you damage the wire, the wire shorts. If you damage the insulation, it shorts as well. Some people's IgM protein will bind to the insulation and it will damage the insulation. And when the insulation is damaged, the nerve's going to short out. And so damage to that, that sheath, which is called myelin, that's the fatty coating around the nerve, around the electrical wire. The IgM binds and damages myelin. And uh, there are blood tests that show the myelin reaction in the blood that causes the nerve to short out. And we refer to that as a symmetric, length-dependent, demyelinating neuropathy because you lose the myelin. Usually not painful, um, but it's unpleasant because you can't feel where your feet are. And over time, it ascends. And that's a specific property of the IgM protein itself. Thank you. Um, I'm giving you a two-minute warning here, Peter, because I'm going to have to go. I was just going to say, it's, it, I think that's about all the questions we can handle for now, given the uh, the timing of the other activities. But Works I want to thank me. you. Sure, I want to thank you again for volunteering your time, as always, and being here to share your knowledge and wisdom with the IWMF community and your unfailing commitment to all of us over the years. We truly appreciate it. Um, Delighted. It's a privilege to speak to everybody. You have a wonderful rest of your conference. You too. Uh, thank you. Bye Appreciate now. It. Okay, bye. Um, on behalf of the IWMF, I would like to extend appreciation also to our EdForum title sponsors, Beijing, and our contributing sponsors, Pharmaceuticals Janssen, Selectar, the Treadway Foundation, and X4 Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're also grateful to everyone out there in the audience for being with us today. So please take a moment to complete the post event survey that will appear on your screen and stay with us. But what that means is at the end of this session, uh, close the window you're in and then navigate back to the theater to join the next session. Our next presentation will begin in just a couple moments.